Good afternoon, all, and welcome to our 4 H PEI webinar on catering to local and regional markets. Um, we'll just get started here in a minute. We just have a few more people coming in. And Leanne and Megan, if you wanted to start your cameras and audio, then uh, we'll get started here in just a minute. Excellent. Great, so uh, it's a beautiful sunny day here in Charlottetown, PEI. I know our, our biggest contender or competitor today is probably the sunshine outside. And uh, I don't blame anybody for, for enjoying that. And uh, we will be recording this session and uh, sending it out to people later if, uh, if they do have to step out for a second for a phone call or to enjoy that sun or take their, cam or their computer outside and, and to watch it from there. My name is Kent Thompson. I'm a director with Food Island Partnership. And as you can tell, I'm working from home. I don't necessarily enjoy wearing these headphones, but my kids are in the kitchen making cookies today. So, so it's different for all of us. You know, life is, is not what we thought it was going to be in, in early 2020. But like so many of you, we've had to rethink and change and do business different than we did in the past. And I'm a member of the Forge PEI committee, and it's a group of people within the food industry that really have always considered, you know, okay, how do we want things to be? It's really something as we've we've looked at through COVID, we've gotten a chance to to stop and say maybe things that were happening before wasn't weren't exactly how we wanted it, and now how do we create things so so we know how we want it to be looking forward. And so normally we would do an annual symposium in the fall, um, full day of sessions, and then a, an immersive experiential time for us to connect, collaborate, come up with new things. So as, as COVID hit, we, we quickly realized that wasn't going to be possible, at least 2020, fingers crossed things will, will continue to improve for 2021 and, and we'll be able to this fall. Um, but the way that we've, we've done things is through webinars and um, really making sure that we're able to continue to connect, you know, talk on ways that we can grow and come out of this, making sure that the new normal is even better than, than what it was in 2019. And I'm really excited about today's webinar because we're starting to plan for the 2021 season and lots of you have already are well into it if, if you run a business year round. And it, as you know, so far it's, you know, the first quarter was much different. Hopefully, you know, with the opening of Atlantic Bubble, it'll be, become a little more familiar to what it was last year. And then hopefully we'll be welcoming guests from across Canada before the year is over. Um, but I'm excited because we'll be doing some research, some talk on some research today. And then we have a panel of innovators that have changed over the past year and continue to change as their business is, is as needed. Um, so if you do have a question, there's a little question box at the bottom. Uh, we'll work to answer the questions throughout. I can't guarantee we'll get to all of them, but if there are some questions that we recognize that the group should really understand and know that the answer is we'll email it out to, to the larger group at the end. So we'll start off today with the research. And we have uh, Megan Miller and Leanne Sarson with MQO Research. MQO is the research arm of Group M5. And M5 has over 200 employees, is one of the largest full service marketing and communications companies in Atlantic Canada with offices in all four Atlantic provinces. MQO has conversations with thousands of Atlantic Canadians every month, and since the pandemic began, has done extensive research on consumer sentiment and topics surrounding travel and the tourism se sector. Well, May Megan and Leanne are going to take us through some research on Atlantic Canadians, and uh, feel free to ask questions, and Leanne will try to field them as, as we go through. Thanks so much, Kent, and thanks to Forage PEI for having us here to, to talk about some of the research that we have to share. Uh, I'm going to get Megan to throw up her screen here, and we're just going to go through a couple um, things before Megan gets into the, the meat of it. But essentially, I, I just wanted to, again, say thank you and uh, talk a little bit about the where this research came from. So early on in the pandemic, when folks were talking about trying to upscale um, the provision of PPE and, and all of the things around supporting healthcare, we realized as a market research company, we couldn't do any of those things. But one thing we could do is try and provide the business community with some insights that might help them with planning. And so um, from March till even as early as February, we have conducted a number of research studies, both with clients in partnership um, with 
groups that we work with frequently and on our own to get a real understanding of what's going on in the mind of consumers and to try and provide information that can be useful to help get us through this. So some of the research we're going to talk about today is uh, an amalgamation of our learnings from um, five studies in particular. There are about 7,000 or more respondents from each of these studies. We also did some focus groups that are wrapped in there. And what we tried to do today is rather than load you down with statistics is really provide the takeaways. Um, so what are some of the key findings from all of this research that we've done over the past year and a bit? Uh, and, and what can we uh, learn and what can we use to, uh, again, not even just to survive, but as Kent said, to, to thrive and to try and look at things differently and, and take this as an opportunity to um, do some strategic plannings and look at what has worked and, and what we can maybe leverage to be better into the future. So I'm going to skip through this because Kent did such a great job of <laughs> introducing us as a company. Uh, those are just some of our locations, some services that Group M5 provides. And again, the session goal. So again, it's just to share some insights on the mindsets of Atlantic uh, Canadians. We also have some research from Central Canada for when that opens up and, and they're able to join us again. Um, primarily, this is going to focus on our learnings on consumer mindsets, particularly in the tourism sector and around uh, folks' comfort with travel and feelings around the pandemic and um, actions that we can take to uh, try and manage uh, how we're welcoming folks back to businesses now that we're opened up again or, or on our way to being open again. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Megan. This is some contact information. As I said, this is from five studies. We have a lot of information. Feel free to reach out to us after if you want um, more detail or if you have some specific questions on anything that uh, Megan goes over. I am going to be manning the chat, so if you have questions as the talk is going on, feel free to throw them up there and I will try and get to them. And with that, I'll pass it on to you, Megan. Fabulous, thank you so much, Leanne. All right, well, um, let's just hop right in and talk about the research. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a substantial impact on Atlantic Canadian economies and the tourism sector in particular. And one thing that has been at the forefront of everyone's mind during this time is, what do we need to know and understand about consumers to help navigate ongoing challenges associated with the pandemic and the economic impacts it's had? So for the past year, NPO Research has investigated traveler sentiment in Atlantic and Central Canada, serving thousands of Canadians and engaging in deeper, more personal conversations closer to home. Some major questions our research has aimed to answer from looking at comfort with events, travel, and tourism as a whole have been, what will and won't travelers do? What do they want to see? And what concerns do they have? And overall, one of our major guiding questions through the work we've done over the past year has been, what are the overall consumer mindset trends when it comes to travel in Atlantic Canada? And what can be done within the industry to adapt to these trends in light of the major changes that have occurred over the past year? We've had some clear answers to these questions and wanna share with you today our top eight insights from our research with suggestions for action in the industry and ways that um, those within the sort of food sphere, the food sector can use these insights for future planning. Point number one, communicating safety without travelers having to ask is essential. To increase travelers' comfort level, uh, businesses need to be able to effectively communicate that health and safety measures are being followed. So according to a recent poll we conducted with Atlantic Canadians on topics related to COVID-19, we found that spending habits are going back up. That is, fewer people report spending less than normal since the pandemic began. However, people are making different choices about how they're spending. And we know that travelers are most concerned with social distancing measures being in place while traveling, followed by being able to sanitize their hands while traveling, and are cognizant of the potential for contracting COVID-19. So 65% of respondents to our larger travel study uh, indicated that social distancing is one of the top three most important measures they wanted to see while traveling in 2020. We also know that travelers do not want to have to ask about whether a venue or accommodation is sanitized or safe. They want to be sure. And any room for doubt will reduce participation in anything related to tourism. This is why finding ways to clearly communicate what is being done will be essential. So for example, social media is a great tool for sharing up-to-date information on what venues look like, what measures are being taken, things like how to get to bathrooms and facilities. And this is really where travelers will be looking to get that information. 
So it'll be crucial to have an updated strong social media presence for your business, for your operation to provide this to consumers. Collectivist messages can, messaging continues to be uh, prominent in Atlantic Canada, highlighting what measures are being taken on the operator side and communicating what visitors should do will fit within the theme of teamwork and togetherness that we've seen. So advertising and messaging can really lean on the idea of collective empowerment when being clear, accessible, and informative. So larger scale programs for standardizing adherence to health and safety measures are one way to make travelers feel safe. So for example, as part of their overarching safe and clean initiative, the Girls Morton region in Newfoundland and Labrador advertises the safe and clean certified designation to local licensed businesses, which includes restaurants, um, as a certification that businesses are going above and beyond when it comes to public health guidelines on safety. This provides a kind of seal of approval that visitors can look to for assurance that procedures are being followed to the highest standard. Point number two, travelers are looking for good deals and limited time offers and would book if the deal was enticing enough. During the summer, last summer, many travelers were taking a wait and see approach to booking travel. Not much has changed since then. We know travelers are still hesitant to book trips too far ahead or commit to annual habitual trips to potentially international destinations. This provides a unique opportunity to take advantage of the shorter lead time in decision making. You know, people are thinking much more flexibly about travel right now and are more likely to be spontaneous in booking, which will likely extend into the coming summer months. Despite the fact that we'll be going into a tourism season where we expect to see increased confidence compared to last year, certainly, we may not reach pre-COVID levels because there still will be that portion of the population who may not be vaccinated by that time. So things like flash sales, package deals, or freebies may be enough to prompt travelers to pull the trigger on booking a getaway. And Atlanta Canadians we spoke to recently agreed that they were feeling more spontaneous about their booking and that a great deal or opportunity would be enough for one to, as one person put it, hop in the group chat with their friends and start planning a getaway. What we can do is promote cooperation among vendors to promote um, and provide enticing offers to those itching to travel. So for example, PEI Tourism it promotes local package deals, which include combinations of activities, all-inclusive prices for accommodations, activity passes, gift cards, that kind of thing. And you know, summer packages are being advertised now for the upcoming summer months. And this is a clear example of vendors working together to provide a good local experience benefiting all involved. And gift vouchers could be offered for your business, your restaurant, your operation um, as part of these package deals. So although we have yet to explore the incidence of the sentiment in the central Canadian market, we do know that there continues to be significant opportunity in the Atlantic Canadian market right now as highlighted in our next points. Point number three. Travelers want to stay close to home right now, but that doesn't mean they don't want to have leisure experiences. So similar to other places in the world, our research has consistently shown that Canadians intend to stick close to home when traveling in the near future. And the greatest areas of opportunity are staycations. Um, and this is unlikely to be you know, surprising to anyone at this point. When we surveyed Canadians in July and August of last year, 70% of Central Canadians said they would be likely to travel within their own province this coming spring and summer 2021 if a vaccine were not available, and 77% of Atlantic Canadians said the same. And we're looking into what this looks like now in the current um, you know, season, but as noted, this is unlikely to change significantly since that time. So this could be a perfect time to really inspire pride in one's home province and what it has to offer. And this includes unique Atlantic Canadian foods, these local flavors, maybe something that your province does best of anyone or your region um, does best of anyone. So the focus will be on leisure experiences that may not require much time on the road, for example, dining experiences, um, but it could also include things like sightseeing, shopping, spot package, that kind of thing. Shorter trips can really be built around these experiences, um, especially during the winter months, and we're kind of moving out of that now. We heard that driving long distances was not as appealing of an option, but that a good event or experience, including fantastic food offerings, could be turned into a full weekend trip. Um, and this mindset can be expected to carry over at least until the, the full summer season. So all in all, those in the industry may have significant success with local consumers over the next year. And we have only to think about what's unique about what we do to kind of put that in action. Point number four, unsurprisingly, 
travelers are wary of large crowds. And this includes for events, accommodations, transportation, and dining. And this was consistent across these research areas. So for example, travelers we surveyed tended to prefer transportation options that allow them to avoid strangers and takeout options for dining. They would like to see clear measures in place to ensure that crowds are small, capacities for venues is low, and that they can limit exposure to those outside their immediate circle. So people really just want to control their interactions with those outside their group. And, you know, this may all sound like operators or business owners shouldn't pursue uh, engaging with larger events, which is not necessarily true. The key here is finding a balance of the precautions in place and being aware of the mindset the travelers want control over their level of risk. They don't necessarily want to stop going to events altogether, but they're wary, and this is the key word. So what can be done? We can invest in offerings that allow for distance and communicate capacity limits wherever possible. So, you know, a great example of this in action was Halifax's uh, Christmas at the Forum Market. And this was a Christmas market that's, you know, a staple in the city. And in 2020, clear measures were put in place to ensure maximum distancing without closing altogether. Things like venue capacity, time slot booking, one-way traffic, traffic, and making sure that the market could run for longer, giving everyone the opportunity to visit. And this market had plenty of food options that were offered in a safe, accessible way. Point number five, businesses across industries have found novel ways to move into online spaces and consumers will appreciate digitized options within tourism now and in the future. According to recent consumer research, more people expect to spend more money using online options and make their current habits more permanent fixtures post pandemic. Through our research, we found that travelers are comfortable booking and ordering online and are interested in digital travel packages and itineraries. Um, this includes making food orders online. And these things kind of contribute to allowing travelers to control more of their experience with their travel parties and help build confidence and participation. Consumers will expect and appreciate um, an uptake of digitized experiences within your operations, something we've already begun to see in other locations, regardless of public health concerns. So for example, in other parts of the world, contactless options are extremely popular already. And we also know that contactless options for payment using TAP has increased substantially over the past year, as have other forms of electronic invoicing and payment. So these are just a few ways to stay agile within what consumers are looking for. So there are lots of options for digitizing offerings, including user-friendly online storefronts, um, self-guided tours of foodie hotspots, this kind of thing. And this will really make the difference in continuing to adapt to the needs of the present moment and what consumers are starting to expect moving into the future. Point number six, the new normal can have long-term implications for strategy moving forward. And this touches a little bit on what Kent and Liam discussed a little bit ago. So we really have a captive audience right now. For example, people are far more likely to change their consumer behavior since the beginning of the pandemic in, in favor of trying new things and supporting local. And where travelers might typically go on a pre-planned vacation this year, they'll be more open to creating new habits and traditions as a result of these disruptions. So for pe people who may typically go down south for a holiday or to another location for an annual trip, the possibility is really there to create a new tradition in its place, something people can continue to do even as the ultimate end of the pandemic is still far off. So Atlantic Canadians we spoke to recently said they're looking to replace what they'd find in a tropical vacation, you know, relaxation, all inclusive deals uh, for something more local. And that means their dollars are staying here too. So the solutions we implement now don't have to be a short-term band-aid, but really provide an opportunity to adapt to changes already taking place in all the areas we've discussed and new possibilities for the future. Therefore, the new normal is an exciting opportunity to ignite major industry growth in Atlantic Canada and capture a brand new consumer base. Point number seven, travelers want to support local, but local may need more support. Some Atlantic Canadian travelers we spoke to more recently highlighted the importance of supporting businesses close to home. So as highlighted uh, through the presentation, recent consumer research has shown that people are thinking a bit more about the brands that they support, the businesses that they support, and more people are considering supporting local and plan to continue to do so. However, many small businesses have had closed head to close their doors or they're struggling. 
So there are key opportunities more immediately to support small businesses during the you know, upcoming you know, spring, early summer season by ensuring they can stay open to take advantage of local travel. Um, you know, as we move out of the winter season, we're, we're expecting to continue to see this pulling forward into summer. Um, but supporting smaller businesses doesn't just mean financial. There are other forms of strain involved. This afternoon, we provided tips founded in the research that are easy to talk about, but not always easy to execute. Uh, in addition to the financial strain small businesses might be facing, there's also the strain of having to keep a business afloat and execute changes to adapt while in the middle of a pandemic. And people are really emotionally and mentally taxed and have been for quite some time. And we therefore need to ensure that local businesses, you know, local restaurants um, have the support to take short-term fixes into long-term strategic changes highlighted previously in this webinar. So for example, support services exist for business owners such as the CBDC's virtual advisor program um, with province-specific programming in New Brunswick and PEI and the Newfoundland and Labrador Organization of Women Entrepreneurs, just as a couple of examples. These services offer free mentorship and assistance in navigating the ongoing challenges associated with the pandemic from a business standpoint. When people travel, their trip isn't about one single attraction that they visit, as no single attraction will be enough to draw people to stay. One's overall experience is really a cluster of things involving all players in the region. So, you know, for example, you might go see a natural site, go on a local boat tour, and then you would go visit a cafe, a pub, a restaurant afterwards. And so losing these small experiences impact everyone, not just the small business, but all other players in the region. And therefore it's key that we continue to support each other and monitor each other's needs as losing these small businesses has major impacts for uh, the larger ecosystem in the area. And finally, point number eight, we can focus on what type of experience we want to offer to consumers. We now know that travelers will be focused on seeing and doing new things in their own backyard. We also know they're looking for authentic cultural experiences and the opportunity to learn something new. So part of this can include experiences around a product or a service, um, highlighting what is unique about what you can offer. So for example, um, there is, you know, in Nova Scotia, the Sambro Lighthouse Helicopter Escape package as offered by Tourism Nova Scotia. This is the opportunity to take a private helicopter to Sambro Island, to have a private picnic with gourmet local food options packed in. It's kind of a really a unique luxury experience that a lot of people haven't already had. And they're, they're going to be looking for ways to do brand new things that they haven't done. And maybe they're more likely to spend a little bit more money to do so. So what story will you bring home? What will you explore? Fresh feeling or feeling familiar? These are all ideas for advertising, highlighting the fact that there's so much to explore in one's ba own backyard, so much beauty in Atlantic Canada, and in particular, so much fantastic food, as everyone here knows. And you know, pro promoting these types of experiences around that and products to consumers will be key. So giving consumers a full experience built around your offering and your products will help consumers make longer lasting memories with your business, encouraging others who hear about it to visit too. So I wanted to just give a brief overview of, based on sort of a synthesis of the research, what an ideal getaway for an upcoming, the upcoming year will look like. And we have sort of a, cute, a few key factors that we've touched on throughout. Um, and the key here is this sense of control over one's environment, their travel party, and their level of risk. Uh, so when you're thinking about where you want to position your offering, your product, your business, and what kind of experience your consumer is going to want to have, we can keep these factors in mind, you know, mitigating risk, keeping crowds small, um, you know, making things relaxing, all those kinds of elements. So where do we go from here? Change is ongoing, but adaptation continues to be possible, as we highlighted this afternoon. Taking advantage of the current flexibility will allow the industry to ride the wave. So we can really capture the imagination of Atlantic Canadians. You know, what does Atlantic Canada, what does your region have to offer? And how can we help Atlantic Canadians fall in love with their home all over again? And what is possible? You know, based on what we've seen in consumer confidence research, COVID-19 has been a major catalyst for innovation. And it's important that we don't lose momentum moving into the next year and beyond. So we can really shift our offerings to align with the current consumer mindset. 
you know, it may be a long time before people feel fully comfortable doing many pre-COVID activities, and may, many people may continue to think and feel differently about their world for years to come. However, we can really work with that as demonstrated today and help people see that the new normal is something that can be very positive and exciting for the future. So with that being said, thank you so much for giving us the chance to share the research that we've done and we really look forward to the panel discussion. Thanks, Megan. I think Leanne's been kind of feeling any of the questions in behind the scenes. I just see one that that is on how do you get certified. Megan, you had, had uh, talked about the, the Safe and Clean program that Newfoundland uses. And uh, the, I know that, that uh, Tourism PEI is working with TIPI, our tourism industry, to come up with a similar program. I expect the details of that will be will be out in the next little while. So if anyone's looking for that, just stay tuned to the news or, or check out the TIPI website and those details will be coming. And I, I really liked, Megan, your, your point on, you know, supporting local and, and may need more support. And I'd all also remind people that's kind of the role of Food Island Partnership in a lot of ways is helping, you know, one-on-one -on -one company development. So, so if you do have questions, you know, feel free to check out our website at foodislandpei.ca and, and feel free to reach out to us. So, so thank you very much, Megan and Leanne. We've got an exciting year, hopefully, you know, with safe, safe travels. And uh, we'll probably be checking in with you before, before the season completely kicks off and, and may try to have you back to, to see what the latest research says as well. We'd be happy to be back so and keep Great. you updated. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Well, welcome our our next panel and um, moderator on here. We'll just get set up. My screen seems to be going weird, but I think it, it's looking okay on the <clears throat> everybody. So um, our, our most everybody knows our moderator for our panel session. Uh, Chef Michael Smith is the owner and operator of the Inn at Bay Fortune and a member of our Forage PEI committee. He's also the author of 10 cookbooks, starred in five different Food Network series and is a real leader of the culinary scene in PEI and in Canada. So I'm really excited for, for this panel and, and over to you, Michael. Thank you, Kent. Uh, and uh, I, I share your thanks for uh, what we just heard from MQO. That was uh, extremely, really interesting to hear. In particular, uh, Leanne's point about integrating digital offerings into our businesses. I think uh, we're seeing examples of that throughout the industry. I know it's something we're doing with uh, simple QR codes in, uh, in our greenhouses so guests can uh, do a virtual farm tour. Um, fascinating stuff. Um, and thank you, uh, Kent, too, for uh, bringing Forge together uh, virtually today. Um, we're on the committee together, and uh, Forge uh, has always stood for bringing our industry together and sort of serving as a, a resource to each other, if you will. Uh, not that different from all those chats we've had out back on the loading dock over the years, that sort of thing. Just industry talking to industry. And, and so uh, our thanks to, uh, to everyone that's joining us today. Um, and for taking the time out of your busy worlds to uh, engage with your businesses and, uh, and, and do so by hearing our message. I'm uh, personally really looking forward to hearing the next three speakers and, and hearing what they have to say. Um, we're going to meet three speakers and uh, we've asked them um, in advance to just consider three basic uh, sort of thoughts. Uh, quite simply, uh, how did you pivot last year? How are you approaching this year? And uh, how are you adjusting your marketing specifically now that our market is narrowed to Atlantic Canada? How is that manifesting in your marketing? We're going to meet uh, we're going to meet uh, Patrick Wallace, owner and operator of the legendary Trout Point Lodge, way down in Southwest Nova, closer to home. We're going to hear from Steve Murphy, uh, Blue Muscle Cafe, and of course Slaymakers and Nichols. But first today, straight downtown to meet Heidi Zinn. Heidi lives and breathes tourism, of course. She's been executive director of uh, Discover Charlottetown for more than 10 years now, and, and she really does have her finger on the market, uh, the pulse of the marketplace. I mean, that's, that's what you do, Heidi, in so many ways. Discover Charlottetown, of course, is the DMO that markets Charlottetown to the world, off-island. 
Uh, so they're directly responsible for all that shoulder season development we've seen in recent years, all those great festivals and events that we're seeing. Uh, Charlottetown is a very, very vibrant place. And, uh, and the job falls to you, Heidi, to, uh, to remind the world of that. So let's get started with you today, Heidi. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, you said these are simple questions. I thought these were like huge questions that I had never really sat down and thought about before Emma sent them to me. So I have like a million scribbles uh, in front of me and I hope to not take you guys down too many rabbit holes today. Um, obviously it goes without saying 2020 has been a crazy year. Um, Discover Charlottetown is a DMO. So we're a destination management organization. We are a visitor focused organization. We always have been. Um, we are funded mostly by a hotel levy. So when people come and stay in the hotels, that's how our organization gets funded. So this was a big shift for us. Um, the first couple days of lockdown in March, I was getting annoyed because nobody above us, none of the other departments were telling us what to do or what their plans were. Um, and then I realized that nobody had a crystal ball and that we were, we would all kind of have to figure it out on our own. Um, so we started with very simple scenario planning just with our small staff. We didn't hire any consultants. We just thought, what are the possibilities we're looking at and what does that mean for us as an organization and for you know the 200 members that we represent in Charlottetown? So, um, you know, of course we were looking, is it going to be a hyper-local summer? Is it going to be an Atlantic bubble? Are we going to be lucky and open to the rest of Canada. Um, but one thing was very similar with all of those scenarios is that the common thread was that we needed to have our local population support our local businesses, um, which is something that was always at the back of our minds, but not something that we focused on as a, as a visitor focused organization. So that was the biggest shift for us is to all of a sudden take our local, our community and put that at the front of our minds um, instead of kind of jumping over them and thinking about the visitor first. So um, that, that was a really important realization. And then, as soon as we realized that we weren't going to be marketing to Quebec and Ontario and we were looking at a, a shorter haul market and our local population, we started thinking about how important product was going to be. And we all know that product drives, uh, you know, product drives marketing and, and then that drives demand. So we, we really were trying to think of ways that we can make people feel safe and get them out of their house, their house to come um, and visit Charlottetown. So we, uh, talked to a lot of industry partners and we threw a lot of things at the wall and hope that some things stick. Um, a lot of the things we were making up as we went along, um, but I think we did have some successes and some of the things that we did this year and I think we will carry them and there'll be traditions for future years are things like um, the Scarecrow Festival. Um, you know, talk about a safe way to get people out and just exploring downtown and popping into stores and restaurants and then wrapped around um, the Scarecrow Festival, which we were able to convince, uh, you know, uh, just a couple artists to make 300 scarecrows in like two weeks um, and put them all over town. Um, we also were able to get funding to do a whole bunch of micro events. So, I mean, it was October and we're like, I don't know, I think people like like mystic, like psychic stuff. Like, I don't even know what that means, but like, I think that kind of matches with October. So we're like, let's see if we could find someone that will do like a psychic fair. So we had a psychic fair at Beacons Field. We put tarot card and Oracle readers in restaurants all over the city we had sommeliers and I mean we were totally making this stuff up we had no idea if it was going to work but um I think it did and like you know talking to people you see like you know bar 1911 on a Monday night which wouldn't normally have been full of people there was a full house of people there waiting to get their tarot cards read so um micro events and product development work um i think that's one thing that we learned and we don't always have to go really big we don't have to have no offense shania twain and put her on the waterfront um, to have good product and get people out of their houses um putting a whole bunch of little things together and clustering them to make a festival i think works too and i think that's kind of the only option that we really have for this year um so that was really uh, a good realization for us that we could do a whole bunch of little things and that they would still have impact and, and get people through doors on nights that they wouldn't normally go through the doors. Um, and 
uh, not putting all of our eggs in one basket. Um, I, I preach about winter and shoulder season all the time. Um, I think a lot of us put all of our eggs in the summer basket, and this was a really important lesson that we shouldn't do that. Uh, we should spread, you know, try and spread ourselves out where, when and where we can. And I know Charlottetown's a little bit different, um, but it enabled us to kind of dream bigger for shoulder seasons because there was a lot of opportunity there. Um, so we, you know, we expanded our Christmas festival this year and took the same approach as the Scarecrow Festival and put micro events all over the city and had horse and wagon rides and and did things that um, not only helped to get people out but really kind of helped to brand us more as a winter destination and encourage locals to see us as a winter destination where I think sometimes that's our biggest challenge is that locals um, are a little bit um, underwhelmed with with being here in the winter so um, that was that was kind of fun to do and I think again we'll definitely do that next year um, we worked with um, one of our funding partners to come up with an ignition fund, which helped to put money into the hands of private operators to basically create and do cool things. Um, so we saw dining pods pop up in Charlottetown this winter so people could eat outside. And these aren't things that are gonna go away when COVID goes away. Um, these are things that are gonna help to develop our product for years to come. So, um, you know, I, I hate these words like silver linings and all these things that we've all said way too many times, but these were the silver linings of COVID for us. Uh, we've been able to, you know, have these little tiny wins that have made a big difference. And um, I think the biggest thing for us is, and I, I alluded to this before, is now whenever we think of something, even going forward, I think we'll think of the local first because we have this big movement where we're encouraging everyone how important it is to support local but i think as um as a marketing organization as product development uh you know organization whether you're a restaurant or a business i think it's really important that we all think of locals first and we don't skip over them um when we're thinking of new and creative ideas and I, I remember years ago when many people have heard me say this, uh, I was leading a best practice mission in Asheville. And when we met with the, um, the municipality there, and we, the question was like, how do you build good tours and product? And they said, we don't build tours and product. We build product for locals. And if locals embrace the product, you organically have good tours and product. And then you have an army of ambassadors that are selling your product for you. And they talked about like, I, don't know, I think it was like a drum circle or something that happened organically. It was for to get people out of the house on Sunday. And then this is like one of the biggest tourist attractions. Everyone, when they go to Asheville, wants to go to this drum circle. And again, it happened. It was like this super grassroots thing. And I just think there is so much, um, so much beauty in thinking about things like that. And I think about like our buddies at Nimrods who have done such a good idea. They talk to the local population. They, they celebrate their staff. They, they just have, new cards made of all their staff people and they have micro grants that they're giving to the community and like these people you know no question that COVID was difficult for them but they were kind of a step ahead um, because they had already built that engagement and that dialogue with the local population um, another example is <clears throat> our friend juliet gems uh, whose family also owns the anagram gable store these are two totally different businesses and but run by this, the same family. And Julia does an amazing job engaging the local population with gems and she has conversations with them and gets involved in community events. Whereas the Ann store, I mean, they just had the rudest awakening this year because guess what? People from BEI in Atlanta, Canada don't shop at the Anna Green Gable store. And they realized that they had never taken the opportunity to tell their family story, talk about how their heirs to Ellen Montgomery, um, like, you know, make the link between the museum at, at Park Corner and um, that George Campbell is giving those, you know, the, the carriage rides, you know, all the time. And they're like a super fun thing to do that a lot of locals had never tried. So for the first time this year, they started telling that story. And um, more people, more locals went out and took those carriage rides this year than ever before. So I think that is a really important thing that will not go away. We won't have a different website for locals. We won't have different platforms that, that separate visitors and locals. Um, we want to make sure that we are thinking about locals and, and helping to build an amazing place to live in everything that we do um, and really hope that if they embrace it, then visitors will be right there behind them. Wow. 
Heidi, thank you. So many, uh, so many great aha moments there, um, in particular, and and uh, I, I think uh, I have a, some understanding of what it must have taken to turn that ship. That's a colossal institutional ship to move marketing towards locals away from your focus over the years. So well done, and thank you for sharing uh, every bit of that with us today. Um, on to uh, Steve, Steve Murphy. Uh, you know, Steve Steve is way more than the owner of two wildly awesome restaurants here on PEI. He's the proprietor. You know, that means he's on the ground every single day, you know, working hard. You know, Steve, you and I share that. You know, this is not a call it in from a distance kind of world, is it? You know, no. we're talking, of course, about the Blue Muscle Cafe uh, up on our legendary North Shore. And, of course, uh, the new Slay Makers and Nichols Gastro House which opened, it fells now, Steve, it feels like moments, you know, you opened moments before COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've got a boutique in in your, uh, in your uh, portfolio now as well. You know, I think the thing that defines your, uh, all of your spots more than anything else, though, is you always feel like you're, you're welcome. You always feel like you're home somehow. Your guests feel very, very well taken care of. So Steve, uh, what's on your mind these days? Well, thanks, Chef Michael, for that, and and I'm obviously happy to be here. But I always hate following Heidi; she's a great speaker, but um, I'm a big fan of what they do here in Charlottetown. Her and her team, um, the idea of of think local first, and 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 all the micro events that they did this year are, are, were truly excellent, and they've had a true impact on our business. So uh, I'll do my best to keep up to what uh, Heidi's done so far here today. Uh, for those that don't know me, I, there's my wife and I, Christine and I, own two different restaurants. One is uh, Blue Muscle Cafe, as you alluded to earlier, and it's on the North Shore, and it's it's been around since 1994. But Christine and I bought it in 2013, so it's it's a small sort of seafood shack on the water. If you're not familiar with it, it seats 75 in the uh, pre-COVID days. And it does about 65,000 people a summer. So it's one of those places that's crazy busy, just stays, uh, does about 10 turns a day. So it seats about uh, 750 covers a day. And it's just a machine that keeps on going. And it's a well-oiled machine that's taken us a long time to figure this business out. And then um, in town, we saw, we opened a, you're right, we opened a new business, Claymaker Nichols. We opened it in November, uh, 2019. So yeah, she, sheer moments before COVID hit. So no learning going in, no momentum built up, and then we we're like everybody faced with, uh, what do we do now that uh, we're shut down and, and we're at new normal, as they say. So what do we? One of the things we did at both locations, we took a step back and we had to revise our menu, very similar to what Heidi was talking about. We had to make sure we had locals only as top of mind. And I'll give you an example of Blue Muscle. So Blue Muscle is a, a seafood place. It's mainly seafood, although we offer more than that. It's really known for its fresh seafood. And when people from outside the Atlantic bubble uh, travel, the first thing they always ask for is, is, is boiled lobster. It's one of the things that's on their list that they have to get our lobster, otherwise the trip's just not gonna be complete unless I have a boiled lobster. But as everybody inside the Atlantic bubble knows, I can make that at home. I don't need to go out and get that. It's not a unique experience for someone who has lobster literally uh, minutes away from your house. So we took lobster off the menu, but we replaced it. We took boiled lobster off the menu, I guess. We replaced it with a lobster thermidor. So we want to give, still provide that experience of getting something you can't get at home and try to make it uh, at a special occasion. So if you are going to go out and you are going to spend that hard-earned money during a pandemic, we wanted to give you something that was different than you can get at home. And then at Slaymaker, a Slaymaker was set up just before COVID hit and it was set up as a tapas style restaurant. Smaller plates, lots of sharing plates, everything put in the middle of the table and passed around. And that that didn't go over very well with public health, as you can imagine, during a, during a, a pandemic. So we had to take a look at that and revise our, our uh, menu going back to more of a traditional style menu. The other thing we had to come up, we were faced with is, how do we maintain capacity? Both are relatively small footprints. Um, as I say, Blue Muscle seats 75, but to keep social distancing, we could only get about 32, 33, or 34 inside the restaurant. And at Slaymaker, it was only started with a max capacity of 50, and that was squeezing people in pretty good, to be honest with you. And, uh, during a pandemic and trying to keep everyone safe, we went down to just about 20, a little over 20 people inside this, the restaurant safely. So we built a patio out front of Slaymaker. Now, that wasn't our initial plan, and we, we, we had about two and a half weeks to build and construct it and design it, but thank God we did. It was one of those things. We, were, we purposely built Slaymaker to be more of a winter destination for locals, and then that way we can keep our eye on the monster blue muscle that's going on in North Shore. 
but the patio saved us. It was, it was a big investment, but it, you know, it, it did two things. It, it allowed us to have 22 more seats outside. So we doubled our seating. And when the weather we had last year, if you guys remember, the weather was phenomenal. You could almost count on seating outside every day. But it also, what we didn't realize what it did is it gave us top of mind. It gave us that drive by, hey, look at that. We we're thinking of a place to go out to eat. It gave us that first top of mind recognition. And that was totally by accident. But we, that's one of the learnings that we found out about it. Then we found ourselves like everybody in the takeout game. So uh, we're, that wasn't our thing. Our, our price points on our dishes are a little higher than, than normal. So we're not conducive to takeout. It was not really big as part of our strategy, but we had to find a way to do it. So we didn't have an online presence, which shame on us probably, because that's something we should have had. So the original Slaymaker and Nichols uh, online ordering was you would text me. You would text, I would send out my, my cell phone number to everybody. You would text the order. I would be at home trying to translate that text, confirm the order, and then text it to the to the kitchen. And then we would send you an invoice, you'd pay it online. The, what we, you know, it worked. And, it, and what we realized what worked was there was connection to the guests. People got to know there's a real life person at the end of that. This is not just a business. There's Steve and there's Steve and Christine out there and the staff. So it, it inadvertently worked again that this, this texting to Steve, uh, it created a connection and that people still talk about today. And, they still have my cell phone number out there today. We eventually uh, got our act together and got an online presence and where we now can now order online. And as a learning and to, to take payment online and how to conduct business online, but it's something we looked looked at and we now have in place. And now, now we take advantage of that going forward as we start to find our way out of this pandemic. And then we had a short, the, the shutdown. So we went through a couple of shutdowns and, and what we realized when we first went online, you're texting Steve your order, we stayed with our original menu so it was as if you were eating in, in store. So we had availability of everything online or through text at that point with, with me. And we realized the learning from that was that's incredibly hard to have all those items available, have them, have them all prepped and ready to go on the off chance that somebody may want to order something online. And we realized it was hurting our inventory. It was hurting our, our, our staff are going crazy trying to, trying to prep and keep it going. So the so second time we, this, we, we had to go through a, this uh, shutdown, we went to a take and bake model. You know, we had no no warning that we we're going to go into this circuit breaker shutdown. We had we we took what was a, a negative situation. We, and we relied on our strengths, and our strengths are we keep everything fresh in house. Everything comes from a from a raw ingredient, and then we turn it into something all the time. And that was always our it's always been our philosophy at both restaurants. And when we went through it at, at uh, Slaymaker Nichols, we turned all that fresh ingredients into a casserole style dishes where you take it cold take it home, bake it at home, and have it when you're ready. Then that did a couple of things. It helped us get, make sure we burned through the inventory that we had on hand. But then we realized that need in the marketplace that we never would have dreamt was there before. But there was a lot of people that lived, worked in the city, but lived outside the city. So they wanted to take takeout home. They already didn't want to cook themselves that night for whatever reason. But if they bought a meal on the way out of town, by the time they got to where it is, it wouldn't be as fresh, it wouldn't be as hot, or they wouldn't want it right away. So they found with this program, they were going home and baking it when they were ready and they would ever have a hot meal as the family all arrived at the table and ended up serving again by accident. Uh, it served it served a purpose that we didn't know it was in the marketplace or a need that was in the marketplace. So that's sort of how we kind of fell and tried and failed, but succeeded through uh, the pandemic in, in uh, last year. And now here we are in 2021. So the big question everybody asks, and we're, we're here, here today to talk about it is, What's the plan? What are you doing for 2021? What's the magic answer? What's the crystal ball show? And the reality for us internally is the more we think through this and learn from, from the prior year is we have, we're going to plan to adapt. That's the basis of our plan. So we're, we're going to build a small plan. We have built a medium sized plan and we built a large plan. I know it's, it's oversimplifying it, but this is sort of how we approached it. We're going to build, build a plan of what if the border stays closed and it's just PEI, just the locals. What if we, the border opens at just Atlantic Canada? And what if we, when, when this happens and we get to go national, how are we going to make sure we're ready? So we spent a lot of time with those plans and we're making sure that we are, have the ability to adapt. I think the major, if I, if I could boil down the learning from last year, the learning was you have to be ready. So you have to have all your ducks in a row so that when, you, when you're faced with a situation that you can adapt right away. You don't want to have to say, okay, there's a situation if I can only get this done or I can only build that or I can only be ready, you'll, you'll miss it. So we are going to make sure we're flexible enough that we can adapt to whatever comes our way as much as possible this year. 
So now, with, you know, the question is, what if it's a limited market? How are we going to approach? You know, as as Heidi mentioned, you know, how are we going to make sure we have think local first? And local can be PEI only, or it could be Atlantic Canada. Is kind of how we, two ways we look at it. So, the, the if I simple oversimplify this too, I would say we are going to focus on having a great product. And Chef Michael, I've heard you say this before, and I completely agree with you. Your product's got to be bang on. You got to give a product that people want. It has to start and end with that. If you have a great product people will come to it in theory. So you just, all I can focus on, I can't control COVID. I can't control my competitors. I can only control what we do. So I'm just gonna control putting together a product that's excellent. I'm gonna make sure that the food is the best it can be and the service is the best it can be. And our thing and our tagline at Blue Muscle is we are the authentic PEI seafood experience, or at least that's what we strive to be. So we're gonna focus on that. We're gonna make sure we nail that every time somebody comes in. And the last thing we're going to do is this sounds cheesy and, and hear me out on this because it's going to sound a bit goofy and it, but that's okay that's who i am i suppose is we're, we're not in the food business we're, we're not in the hospitality business we're in the connection business so the building itself just like your building chef michael that the land is a connection it's a memory it's a, it's a, it's an iconic so the, how you approach the business as people walk up the, into your door how they're greeted the smells the sights, the sounds are all connections and memories that are being made along the way. It could be a way the server integrates with the table, how they get to know each other, how they serve the table. Um, this is things I've learned, Patrick, at your place. Is I feel connected to your place because I get to know you and the staff when I'm when I'm there, you know. And that's what it's all about. It's you know, food is a big portion of it, how it tastes, how it presents, how it is it, but it's one aspect out of the whole environment. So. If we can just stay this year in a way to find a way to connect with every guest and, and the way we focus on is we only care about the guest that's in that seat at that time. I don't care about tomorrow. I don't care about marketing to make sure I get more people drive in next month. If I just take care and connect with that guest in that seat, in theory, I'm assuming, you know, we're, we're banking on that the rest will start to take care of itself. So thank you. Thanks for letting, you know, in short here, we're going to adapt. We're going to we're going to learn as we go our way through this. But the main thing is we're going to be ready, and we're going to try to stick to our strengths. So thank you for for the time today, guys. Right on, Steve. And I guess I would suggest that uh, I, I think you're spot on. I think excellence is is always a great strategy. And and as I hear you uh, sort of share with us so many different truths, I think uh, one of those sort of words that we use often as entrepreneurs that are intently focused on our businesses, the, the idea of an accident and learning from that accident. And that word may seem so incidental, accident, but I think you and I both understand that it's always an opportunity. Everything we do is an opportunity to see a new way and a better way of doing things. And, you know, clearly that's been a huge part of your strategy over the last year. So thanks for sharing that with us. And now uh, on to you, Patrick. Uh, Wow, we're uh, we're going away now. We're leaving the island. Not that far though. Um, Patrick uh, Patrick Wallace and his wife Pamela are the owners of Trout Point Lodge, Nova Scotia. This is one of the uh, the world's premier luxury wilderness resorts. And yes, I said that it is one of the world's premier luxury wilderness resorts. How many of us out there didn't even know it was in our own backyard? And they moved to Southwest Nova in 2018 following an unexpected visit to the lodge as guests the year before and ended up buying it. And prior to that, though, Patrick, uh, you spent 20 years in various high tech industries all over the world, while Pamela spent her career with uh, Hilton uh, Worldwide. Nowadays, Patrick curates Trout Point Lodge's award winning wine list, lends a hand around the lodge, and performs other tasks under Pamela's close supervision. That sounds a lot like the org chart at the end of Bay Fortune, Patrick. How are uh, how are you doing over there in Nova Scotia? Uh, we're doing very well, Michael, and thank you to uh, to everybody for the opportunity to uh, you know to spend some time with you today. And uh, uh, that uh, that bio was actually very very accurate. So I am allowed to do uh, uh, certain chores around here with uh, with the right level of supervision, and uh, and so far so good. Um, and uh, I, I just thought I would spend a little bit of time today, um, just kind of giving you a little bit of the story of of sort of how we dealt with uh, with things, kind of going back. Uh, you know, I look on the calendar and say this time last year. Um, 
there was just nothing but uncertainty and nothing but uh, but uh, opaque um, looks in the crystal ball to see what uh, what might happen. Um, and uh, and we've all come a very long way. And I think as uh, as, as Steve and Heidi alluded to, um, you know, there there are going to be some learnings from this, and there are going to be some things that um, that I think will become part of our regular way of working moving forward. Um, and uh, and I think this whole COVID um, experience has has also you know maybe kind of illuminated a few corners of the business where we otherwise might not have really thought to look. Uh, and there are some things that uh, that we will keep post COVID, um, and uh, and we think will actually be uh, be even improvements on uh, uh, on sort of the way that we have done things before. So. Um, in in terms of 2020, um, the uh, obviously the the adherence to all of the the, uh, the the COVID protocols and all of the uh, things that we all needed to adjust to that's uh, you know that that was obviously part of what we needed to do. Um, but we we thought quite a lot to ourselves, um, you know, dealing with dealing with only Nova Scotian guests or only potentially you know um, Atlantic uh, uh, bubble guests. Um, how can we make it as easy as possible for them to, uh, you know, make a decision and come down? Given that you know everybody is affected by this in one way or the other, right? Whether it be your job or whether it be your family or whether it be, you know, somebody that you know. Um, so removing all of those kind of, um, I guess, points of uncertainty in a way uh, was a big piece of what we wanted to do. So um, uh, there were many, many minutes and hours spent on this decision but um, typically our booking window is about uh, about five to six months out so uh, by the time June rolls around most of our June bookings are, are sort of coming in uh, in uh, December January February so we have very long lead times uh, and people make plans in advance and have traditionally come here um, you know with things very well planned out um, and we uh, I think this was one of the best decisions that we made last year is we um, we completely scrapped our cancellation policies and went to a basically a 24 hour um, super flexible cancellation policy where no matter when you were booked um, you could cancel up to 24 hours in advance uh, without any penalties of any kind and uh, of course uh, um, you know uh, that was a that was a, um, a decision that we thought about long and hard um, but we wanted to make it as easy as possible for guests to come here in the context of all this uncertainty um, and honestly at the end of all this we actually found that our, our raw number of cancellations last year went down believe it or not, uh, even with that kind of policy. Um, so we were we were certainly um, uh, doing something where we wanted our guests to uh, to be able to have that flexibility. Um, but at the end of it all, it uh, it actually helped us as well. So that was a real learning uh, and a real uh, uh, I think a good decision just in terms of making it easy uh, when there may be some trepidation. And uh, um, and you know the blunt truth is uh, you know in this context you really don't. Want Want to be on the wrong end of a conversation about cancellations and penalties? That's just, you know, a conversation not worth having in any respect at all. Uh, so we uh, we we knew that, you know, kind of right from the start, and I think made a a pretty good decision um, on uh, on that front. Um, the second thing that uh, that we found in in. Uh, um, in last year that it really gave us an opportunity to, uh, you know, to focus on discrete pieces of our business uh, and things like check-in, for example. So, of course, um, we're a small property. We only have 13 rooms and we're very high touch. Um, that's kind of part of our DNA and part of, uh, of who we are. Um, and we we sort of revamped our check-in process a little bit last year and said, um, when guests uh, when guests come to to us, uh, of course we know you know we know we know who they are. We know uh, we know how long we're staying. And what about the idea of sitting down with our guests? Um, you know, welcoming them in, say, leave your bags here. We'll take care of all that. Come on in, have a glass of wine, have a seat, uh, and we'll spend five or six minutes just going over things one on one. Uh, so without the front desk there, kind of as a barrier. Uh, without a, um, uh, you know, without a, uh, a lineup at the front desk. And we found uh, when we could sit down um, with, with guests and have that, you know, that three or four minute conversation and say, uh, all right, here's what you have booked for your stay. Uh, here are the things that we have, uh, we have planned for you. Um, here are any special requests that you might have. Um, and by the way, you know, uh, we, we are, uh, would like to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing on the, on the COVID front too. So of course, all the legal stuff we do, all the, uh, all the, the protocols we follow, um, but then things like um, there's a seal on your door, which means that your room has been completely uh, disinfected and sanitized. Uh, that seal was put on and nobody has been in there since, right? Um, and uh, some of those vis visible touch points, uh, I think, really, really um, went a long way in terms of giving them, uh, giving our guests some, some confidence and some, uh, uh, and some, some certainty about how we're, you know, how we were operating. Um, and, and also gives us a chance to make a really good connection with, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with guests and just set the stage 
pay off uh, on a really, really firm, uh, good, solid footing. So um, uh, that was something we did in the context of COVID, but we're going to keep doing uh, from uh, from now on. And uh, and I think it's been, you know, uh, what we would probably like to think has been really an improvement uh, on uh, on the way that, uh, that 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 we used to do things. Um, in terms of things that uh, uh, that really worked and, and sort of moved the needle for us, I think uh, um, one we we do have quite a few natural advantages. I think we're a small property on a on a very large. Uh, or a small hotel on a very large piece of property bordering in a vast wilderness. Um, and uh, we sort of half joke that we've been, you know, social distancing out here for years before it was fashionable to do so. Um, so we had a lot of things going uh, going for us, uh, uh, just the way that we we're all set up. Um, but uh, We've um, we were able, I think, in in, in 2020, uh, to really look at our backyard, and uh, one of the one of the, the the big big positives were um, the number of last minute bookings that we got. So uh, it makes perfect sense in retrospect that, um, of course, people coming from closer by, not making longer term plans because of you know things changing all the time. Uh, it made perfect sense that those short you know those longer uh, or shorter um, window uh, bookings and last minute uh, types of bookings uh, were were very prominent this year. Uh, no Normally, in, in most years, if we get a cancellation within two weeks, uh, we always thought that that room was effectively, you know, sort of very difficult to, uh, you know, to refill. Um, but we were able, uh, quite successfully, I think, to uh, uh, to focus on last minute uh, and uh, and sort of, I guess, impromptu bookings. Um, and uh, uh, to the extent that uh, that we, you know, when we did get the odd cancellation here and there, we were typically able to fill up that room within 24, 48 hours, uh, all on the basis of uh, on the backs of local uh, uh, of local visitors. Um, and uh, we are very, very thankful, and we've really doubled down on things like social media, uh, where um, uh, our, you know, our Instagram started from zero. And now we're over 10,000 and, and still growing, and that really did, uh, you know, really did move the needle for us as well. Just because, uh, of course, there's a credibility factor that comes when other people are talking about you that you lack when, uh, you know, when you're talking about yourself. Uh, so we really did, uh, we really did like that. And found uh, between social media and uh, uh, and uh, our ability to really drive last minute bookings uh, that um, uh, that we were able to shorten that booking window in a uh, uh, in a really interesting way um, and uh, uh, Heidi I think it was you that alluded to it before talking about uh, uh, about you know the value of local visitors and the value of uh, of um, uh, of uh, the local market and um, certainly if you put that into you know kind of lifetime value terms or things like that the uh, the value of a happy Nova Scotian or Atlantic bubble guest for us uh, is as high as anybody out there in the world for sure uh, because of their propensity to return and because of of course word of mouth being so uh, you know so important in uh, in this in this tinier context uh, so we've been we've been very encouraged um, with respect to 2022 um, or sorry 2021 we're uh, uh, we're looking at keeping a lot of that of those same uh, those same um, sort of uh, procedures in place. Um, in one respect, I think this will be a little bit more of a challenge this year than it was in 2020, uh, when a year ago, uh, we kind of knew the door was closing uh, and uh, we were wondering how fast it would close and then what we would do once that door was closed to the outside. Um, a challenge comes now with the opposite problem of the door opening uh, and how quick that'll open, what we do with backlog, uh, how we manage inquiries from outside of the province. So um, we're 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 as nimble as we can be, uh, and uh, and we've tried to. Uh, to say for the moment we are taking bookings from outside of the province um, and outside of the bubble uh, and we've uh, sort of drawn a little bit of a, of a line to say within two months uh, we'll start scrubbing that out and, and communicating very actively with guests uh, about the likelihood of them being able to come in uh, and just keeping our, our finger on the pulse as best as we can and with all the uh, the changing rules. So I think in that respect, uh, it might be a little more of a challenge this year uh, with that door opening and the speed and all the circumstances. And, uh, uh, you know, I guess there's one thing for sure that uh, you can make all the plans you like, but uh, but life will in, uh, will uh, will intervene and you'll have to be nimble and flexible. And we just try to, uh, you know, try to build that into the plan as, uh, as best we can. Um, and, uh, you know, the other, uh, the other interesting thing, I think for, uh, you know, for 2021 is, 
um, the focus on uh, really playing to a few of our strengths where we do have um, a, a value proposition that aligns very well with what a lot of people are looking for. So we've uh, we've always, I think, been known for you know sort of the high end accommodations and the cuisine and the wine and uh, and the outdoor experiences. Uh, and we've really doubled and even tripled down on things like uh, guided activities, where uh, they've always been a part of a stay here. Um, but uh, when you have when you have something like that, that is. Um, so well um, suited for a COVID environment where people, um, you know, shy away from crowds and, and outdoor is always better than indoor uh, and all that. We've been able to, uh, you know, kind of turn up a little bit with the uh, with some of those uh, those things that play to our strengths in a uh, in a COVID environment. Um, and uh, and that's, uh, you know, I think uh, part of what we've been doing for the last uh, year or so. Uh, but I, I, I do think that that will stay with us uh, post COVID. And uh, it's just kind of um, opened our eyes to you know some of the other elements of the value proposition. I think that uh, uh, that might really play well with uh, with people in the COVID uh, world. Um, and I guess the last point we'd uh, we'd make, uh, particularly around 2021 and beyond, is um, and we've made this uh, you know in our discussions with uh, Tourism Nova Scotia and, and other uh, sort of industry associations. Um, we said you know Atlantic Canada is just primed, I think, for an absolute explosion of activity as soon as COVID really is truly behind us. Uh, and I think about the rest of Canada, uh, if you're sitting in Toronto or in Montreal or Quebec City or wherever, um, you know, and everybody has this pent up desire to, to travel and, and get out in the world and do things that they used to do. Um, I, I would imagine that uh, many people will cautiously um, decide to stay a little closer to home than they might otherwise have. Um, and, uh, you know, it might be save that two week trip to Wuhan for 2023 uh, and come to uh, and come to uh, Atlantic Canada in uh, in 2021 or 2022. Um, so I think we're we're really um, we're really um, poised for an for, for an incredible opportunity um, for a big, you know, I don't know if coming up party is the right word, but welcome back party, I suppose, uh, for uh, for the rest of Canada and the rest of North America, uh, when people want to take those few, you know, those few steps, but still be in a, in a familiar surrounding, maybe still drive rather than fly, uh, maybe not not need to bring the passport or not need to worry about, you know, sort of international uh, uh, restrictions. So we think uh, uh, cautiously and optimistically that uh, that uh, there is probably no play no place in North America, uh, uh, with so many things lined up uh, in the positive uh, as uh, as Atlantic Canada, so that that's really really encouraging for us uh, as we uh, as we move forward. Um, and uh, you know, with uh, with everything as well, I think Steve made the point too that it's uh, it's really about being able to adapt and. Uh, being able to uh, uh, being able to um, you know uh, try to deal with uh, with with uh, circumstances as uh, uh, as they arrive and have a really good game plan for for pretty much anything. Uh, but the feedback uh, so far, particularly with our with our Nova Scotia guests uh, and our Atlantic Bubble guests, has been uh, has been very very positive. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, we did have quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of things lining up in our favor to begin with, uh, and it really forced us, I think, to look at uh, uh, look long and hard at our uh, our value proposition and how we uh, and how we um, you know sort of present that to uh, you know to the local community. Uh, so the short term stays have been uh, uh, the short term bookings have been extremely encouraging, uh, and then some of these other activities like we've we have a you know sort of a girls weekend or a staycation type of thing where it's more focused on getting in the car for a short stay, uh, uh, coming back and uh, uh, and um, you know spending two three days kind of thing. And uh, and uh, the the comment that makes me the happiest is when guests say you know I I, I drove three hours but it really feels like I've gotten away. Uh, and uh, and I think that's just uh, that's just wonderful feedback that uh, uh, that we're really really proud about. So those are just sort of a few things that uh, uh, that we've uh, you know sort of lessons that we've learned uh, over the past year and things that we have planned going into uh, into this season as well. Awesome, Patrick. Thank you so much. There's there's a lot there, and we run very similar businesses. I'm I'm thrilled to hear the optimism in your voice, and I I, I share your strategy. Um, and so as we as we start to wrap things up today, I'll just quickly answer the three questions myself and I'll do it as fast as I can. I think a lot of folks know how we pivoted last year. We, like Steve, uh, we ended up in the uh, high volume takeout business, which for us translated to picnics on our front yard. We saved our business, we saved our team. And uh, I think we made a whole lot of friends on Prince Edward Island too, that I'm immensely, immensely happy and proud of. Seeing families engaged around picnics no matter how low the darn margin was on those things, but seeing those families out in our yard all last summer, it really, really brought hope for all of us. Um, this year, 
we're back. Uh, we're all in. Um, it's terrifying, but I can see very clearly that strategy for my business, I've got to get back where we were in the marketplace. Um, and so we're we're going back to doing our, our feast every night and uh, running a very exclusive, very expensive hotel. Um, it takes a lot of gumption to do that, Patrick, as you know. Uh, but if you can deliver on quality, I can charge a thousand dollars a night as long as I can figure out how to deliver that quality. And that's what's terrifying about it. So that is our strength. That is what we have done for years. It's what we've been successful at. It's what has allowed us to build a massive payroll and, and buy tons and tons of great local ingredients. So I'm as fiercely committed to those folks, our suppliers and our team as I am to our guests. And so that's our strategy. We're back. We're all in. We're going to go for it. Um, it's going to be a very interesting ride this year. I think we are going to see a long, slow ramp up to our season. But um, to that point, there's, that demand is only going to build through the year. For the first time in 30 years, our property will be staying open all the way through till the end of October. And we are going to have a very interesting play in November on weekends only. And that's just mind-blowing that the NFA Fortune could do that. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you all today for, uh, for coming and spending time with us and hearing and listening and uh, taking the time to share your thoughts. Patrick, Heidi, and Steve, you guys are all rock stars. We're all in this together. We've all learned so much over the last year. And I think we've all learned a lesson or two that we're going to charge forward with as well. Kent, uh, thanks for having me as your uh, your host today. And uh, Forage, we haven't gone anywhere. Everybody out there, you never know. We might just be toasting marshmallows around a campfire this year. I hope so. <laughs> Over to you, Kent. Yep. Thanks, Michael, and great job. And thanks to all of our panelists and presenters today. Really appreciate taking the time to to share your stories. And, and I one thing I like from everybody is there is optimism. And, you know, if you think back this time last year, we didn't know where we were going. I think we all know more where we're going. Fingers crossed we'll be able to get there <laughs> and, and there'll only be a couple of bumps in the road. So we will be continuing uh, to plan some webinars as needed and as requested. So please follow along on social media. I think we are on both Facebook and Instagram as Forage PEI. Um, and if you have specific questions, send them along through the social media channels or suggestions on people or discussions you'd like to hear and then we'll work to organize it. So thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>